Hello people, thank you for joining me for another segment of Black Boy. It'll be about 25 minutes. And um, with this segment, it made me think about another book I was reading not long ago. The book is called Washington Black. I'm sorry I don't um, remember who the author is. But in this book, Washington Black, um, there were the enslaved Africans in the South who had started to commit suicide rather than be subject to the treatment and the situations that they were subject to. Hey, Rachel, here goes your dad's uh, <laughs> picture, the one when he ran into an elephant butt. Remember that? Okay, so anyway, um, it reminds me of when the enslaved Africans had started to commit suicide instead of be subject to what they were subject to in the South um, with being enslaved. And um, then their, the slave owners started to, um, I guess in a way, preach this, you can't go to heaven thing. And it had less to do with being concerned with their souls, but had more to do with control and not wanting to lose their free labor. So that's what came up for me today when I was reading, and I'm going to start on page 111. Uh, yesterday you will remember, or maybe you won't remember, and if you didn't start from the beginning, I just suggest that you do because you just are missing a lot of information. But yesterday, um, Richard insisted on going home because there was a boy who had died in the room where he was sleeping, and he just couldn't get it out of his head. And... Uh, and so he insisted on going home and he, he, he kind of started to fail out of school because he, he didn't sleep. He just couldn't sleep thinking that he was in the room of a, a boy who had died and in the same bed. Okay, so Black Boy, part eight, starting from page 111. Um, he's talking to his uncle about going home. I looked at him and did not answer. There flashed through my mind a quick running picture of all the squalid hovels in which I had lived. And, made me, and it made me feel more, even more a stranger as I stood before him. How could I have told him that I had learned to curse before I had even learned to read? How could I have told him that I had been a drunkard at the age of six? When he took me to the train that Saturday morning, I felt guilty and did not want to look at him. He gave me my ticket and climbed, and I climbed hastily aboard the train. I waved a stiff goodbye to him through the window as the train pulled out. Then when I could see his face no longer, I wilted. Relaxing, tears blurred my vision. I leaned back and closed my eyes and slept all the way there. I was glad to see my mother. She was much better, though still a bed. Another operation had been advised by the doctor and there was hope for recovery, but I was anxious. Why another operation? A victim myself of too many hopes that had never led to anywhere. I was for letting my mother remain as she was. My feelings were governed by fear and I spoke to no one about them. I had already begun to sense that my feelings varied too far from those people around me who, for me, from those, whoop, I'm sorry. I had already begun to sense that my feelings varied too far from those people around me for whom to blab about what I felt. I did not re-enter school. Instead, I played alone in the backyard bouncing a rubber ball off the fence, drawing figures in the soft clay with an old knife, or reading what books I could find around the house. I ached to be of the age to take care of myself. Until Uncle Edward arrived from Carter's to take my mother to Clarksdale for the operation, at the last moment I insisted upon taking the train with them. I dressed hurriedly and went to the station. Throughout the journey I sat brooding, afraid to look at my mother, wanting to return home, and yet wanting to go on. We reached Clarksdale and hired a taxi to the doctor's office. My mother was jolly, brave, smiling, but I knew she was as doubtful as I was. When we reached the doctor's waiting room, the conviction settled in me that my mother would never be well again. Finally, the doctor came out of his, in his white coat and shook hands with me, then took my mother inside. Uncle Edward left to make arrangements for the room and a nurse. I felt crushed. I waited. Hours later, the doctor came to the door. How's my mother? She'll be fine. Will she be all right? Everything will clear up in a few days. Can I see her now? No, not now. 
Later, Uncle Edward returned with an ambulance and two men who carried a stretcher. They entered the doctor's office and brought my mother out. She lay with closed eyes, her body swathed in white. I wanted to run to the stretcher and touch her, but I couldn't move. Why are they taking Mama that way? I asked Uncle Edward. There are no hospital facilities for colored here, and this is the way we have to do it, he said. I watched the men take the stretcher down the steps. Then I stood on the sidewalk and watched them lift my mother into the ambulance and drive away. I knew that my mother had gone out of my life, and I could feel it. Uncle Edward and I stayed in the boarding house. Each morning, he went to the rooming house to inquire about my mother, and each time he returned, gloomy and silent. Finally, he told me that he was taking my mother on back home. What chance has Mama really got? I asked him. She's very sick. We left Clarksdale. My mother rode on a stretcher in the baggage car with Uncle Edward attending her. Back home, she lay for days groaning and her eyes were vacant. Doctors visited her and left without making any comment at all. Granny was frantic. Uncle Edward, who had gone home, returned and still more doctors were called in. They told us that a, a, blood clot, a blood clot had formed on my mother's brain and that another paralytic stroke paralytic stroke had set in. Once in the night, my mother called to me. I went to her bed and she told me that she could not endure the pain, that she wanted to die. I held her hand and I begged her to be quiet. That night, I ceased to react to my mother. My feelings were frozen. I merely waited upon her knowing that she was suffering she remained in bed 10 years, gradually growing better, but never completely recovering, relapsing periodically into her paralytic state. The family had stripped itself of money to fight mother's illness, and there was no more forthcoming. Her illness gradually became an accepted thing in our house, something that could not be stopped or helped. My mother's suffering grew into a symbol in my mind, gathering itself all the poverty, the ignorance, the helplessness, the painful, the baffling, hunger-ridden days and hours, the restless moving, the futile seeking, the uncertainty, the fear, the dread, the meaningless pain and the endless suffering. Her life set in the emotional tone of my life, colored the men and women I was to meet in my future, conditioned my relation to events that had not yet happened, determined my attitude and situations to circumstances I had yet to face. A somberness of spirit that I was never to lose settled over me during the slow years of my mother's unrelieved suffering. A somberness set in me that was to make me stand apart and look upon excessive joy with suspicion. That was to make me self-conscious. That was to make me keep forever on the move as though to escape a nameless fate seeking to overtake me. At the age of 12, before I had one full year of formal schooling, I had the conception of life that no experience was ever to erase. For what was real to me was that no argument could ever gainsay. A sense of the world that was mine and mine alone. A notion as to what life meant that no education could ever alter. A conviction that the meaning of living came only when one was struggling to wring a meaning out of meaningless suffering. At the age of 12, I had an attitude toward life that was to endure, that was to make me seek those areas of living that would keep it alive, that was to make me skeptical of everything while seeking everything, that was to make me tolerant of all, yet critical. The spirit I had caught gave me an insight into the sufferings of others, made me gravitate toward those whose feelings were like my own, made me sit for hours while others told me of their lives, made me strangely tender. and It made me want to drive coldly into the heart of every question and it lay open to the core of suffering I knew that would find I would find there. It made me love burrowing into psychology, into realistic and naturalistic fiction and art, into whose whirlpools of politics that had the power to claim the whole of men's souls. It directed my loyalties to the side of men in rebellion. It made me love talk 
that sought answers to questions that could help nobody, that could only help alive in me the enthralling sense of wonder and the awe in the face of drama, of human feeling, such as hidden by the external drama of life. Chapter four. Granny was an ardent member of the Seventh-day Adventist church, and I was compelled to make pretense of worshiping her God, which was her exaction from my keep. The elders of her church expounded a gospel clogged with images of vast lakes of eternal fire, of seas vanishing, of valleys of dry bones, of the sun burning to ashes, of the moon turning to blood, of the stars falling to the earth. Her religion of a wooden staff being transformed into a serpent, of voices speaking out the clouds, of men walking upon water, of God riding the whirlwinds, of water changing into wine, of the dead rising to the living, and of the blind seen, of the lame walking, of salvation that teemed with fantastic beasts, having multiple heads and horns and eyes and feet, Sermons of statues possessing cosmic tale that began before time and ended with the clouds of the rolling sky of the second coming of Christ. Chronicles that concluded with Armageddon. Dramas thronged with billions of human beings who had ever lived or died as God judged quick and dead. While listening to the vivid language of the sermons, I was pulled toward emotional belief but as soon as I left out of the church, I saw the bright sunshine and felt th a throbbing life of the people in the streets. And I knew that nothing, none of it was true and that nothing would happen. Once again, I knew hunger, biting hunger, hunger that made my body aimlessly restless, hunger that kept me on edge, that made my temper flare, hunger that made me hate and made hate leap out of my heart like the dart of a serpent's tongue. Hunger that created in me odd cravings. No food that I could ever dream of half so utterly delicious as, no food that I could dream of was half so utterly delicious as vanilla wafers. Every time I had a nickel, I would run to the corner grocery store and buy a box of vanilla wafers and walk back home, slowly, so I could eat them all up without having to share them with anyone. Then I would sit on the front steps and dream of eating another box. The craving would finally become so acute that I would force myself to be active in order to forget my hunger. I learned a method of drinking water that made me feel temporarily full, whether I had the desire for water or not. I would put my mouth under a faucet and turn the water on full force and let that stream of water cascade into my stomach until my stomach was tight. Sometimes my stomach ached, but I felt full for at least a moment. No pork or veal was ever eaten in Granny's house. And rarely was there any meat of any kind. We seldom ate fish. And then only those that had scales with spines. Baking powder was never used. It was alleged to contain a chemical harmful to the body. For breakfast, I ate mush and gravy made from flour and lard. For hours afterwards, I belched. We were constantly taking bicarbonate of soda for indigestion. At four o'clock in the afternoon, I ate a plate of greens cooked with lard. Sometimes on Sundays, we bought a dime's worth of beef, which usually turned out to be uneatable. Granny's favorite dish was peanut roast, which she made to resemble meat, but which tasted like something else. My position in the household was a delicate one. I was a minor, an uninvited dependent. A blood relative who professed no salvation, whose soul stood in mortal, mortal peril. Granny intimidated me boldly, based in her logic on God's justice. That one sinful person in a household could bring the whole wrath of God upon the entire establishment. Damning both the innocent and the guilty. On more than one occasion, she interpreted my mother's long illness as a, result, as a result of my faithlessness. I became skilled at ignoring her cosmic threats and developed a callousness toward all metaphysical preachments. But Granny won an ally in her efforts to persuade me to confess her God. On Addie, 
her youngest child, had just finished Seventh-day Adventist religious school in Huntsville and came home to argue that if the family was compassionate enough to feed me, that if the family was compassionate enough to feed me, then at least in return, I was to follow its guidance. She proposed that when in the fall school term started, I should be enrolled in a religious school rather than in a secular one. If I refused, I was placing myself not only in the position of a horrible infidel, but of a hard-hearted ingrate. I raised arguments and objections, but my mother sided with Granny and Aunt Addie, and I had to accept. The religious school opened, and I put on a sullen attendance. Twenty people, pupils ranging in age from 5 to 19, and in grades from primary to high school, were crowded into one classroom. Aunt Addie was the only teacher, and from the first day, an acute bitterness and antagonism sprang up between us. This was the first time she had ever taught school, and she was nervous. She was self-conscious because a blood relative of hers, a relative who was, would not confess her faith, who was not a member of her church, was in her classroom. She was determined that every student should know that I was a sinner and from whom she did not approve, and that was not to be granted consideration of any kind. The pupils were a docile lot, lacking in that keen sense of rivalry which made the boys and girls who went to public school a crowd in which a boy was tested and weighed, in which he caught a glimpse of what the real world was. These boys and girls were willless. Their speech was flat, their gestures vague, their personalities devoid of anger or laughter or enthusiasm, devoid of passion or despair. I was able to see them with an objectivity that was inconceivable to them. They were claimed wholly by their environment and could imagine no other environment, whereas I had come from another plane of living. I came from swinging doors of saloons, the railroad yard, the roundhouses, street gangs, river levees, and orphan home. I had shifted from town to town and home to home, had mingled with grown-ups more than perhaps was good for me. I had to curb my habit of cursing, but not before I had shocked more than half of them and had embarrassed Aunt Addie to helplessness. As the first week of school grew to a close, the conflict that had smoldered between Aunt Addie and me flared openly. One afternoon, she rose from her desk and walked down the aisle and stopped beside me. You know better than that, she said, tapping a ruler across my knuckles. Better than what? I asked, amazed, nursing my hand. Just look at that floor, she said. I looked and saw that there were many tiny bits of walnuts meat, walnut meat scattered about. Some of them had been smeared into grease spots on the clean white pine boards. At once, I knew that the boy in front of me had been eating them. My walnuts were still in my pocket. I don't know anything about that, I said. You know better than to eat in my classroom, she said. I haven't been eaten, I said. Don't lie. This is not only a school, but this is God's holy ground, she said with angry indignation. Aunt Addie, my walnuts are in my pocket. I'm Miss Wilson. She corrected. I stared at her speechless, at last comprehending what was really bothering her. She had warned me to call her Miss Wilson in the classroom and not Aunt Addie. For the, for the most part, I had done so. She was afraid that if I called her Aunt Addie, I would undermine the moral of the students. Each pupil knew that she was my aunt, and many of them had known her longer than I had. I'm sorry, I said and turned from her and I opened my book. Richard, get up. I did not move. The room was tense, my fingers gripped the book and I knew that every pupil, pupil in the room was watching. I had not eaten the nuts. I was sorry that I had called her Aunt Addie, but I did not want to be singled out for a gratuitous punishment. And two, I was expecting the boy who sat in front of me to devise some sort of lie to save me, since I was really the one not the one who was guilty. Excuse me. I asked you to get up, she shouted. I sat, not taking my eyes off my book, 
Suddenly, she caught me by the back of my collar and yanked me from the seat. I stumbled across the room. I spoke to you, she shouted hysterically. I straightened to look at her. There was hate in her eyes. Don't you look at me that way, boy. I didn't put those walnuts on the floor, I exclaimed. Then who did? Now my street gang code was making it hard for me. I had never informed upon a boy in public school, and I was waiting for the boy in front of me to come to my aid, lying, making up excuses, anything. In the past, I had taken punishment that was not mine to protect, to protect the solidarity of the gang, and I had seen other boys do the same. But the religious boy, God helping him, did not speak. I don't know who did it, I said finally. Go to the front of the room, Aunt Addie said. I walked slowly to her at her desk, expecting to be lectured. But my heart quickened when I saw her go to the corner and select a long green limber switch and came toward me. I lost control of my temper. I haven't done anything, I yelled. She struck me and I dodged. Stand still, boy, she blazed, her face livid with fury, her body trembling. I stood still, feeling more defeated by the righteous boy behind me than Aunt Addie. Hold out your hand. I held out my hand, vowing that I would never again let this happen to me, no matter what the price. She stained the palm until it was red. Then she lashed me, lashed me across my bare legs until welts rose. I cramped my teeth in order to keep from uttering a single whimper. When she finished, I continued to hold out my hand, indicating to her that her blows could never really reach me, my eyes fixed and unblinking upon her face. Put down your hand and go to your seat, she said. I dropped my hand and turned on my heels. My palms and legs were on fire and my body was taut. I walked in a fog of anger toward my desk. I'm not through with you, she called after me. She had said one word too many. Before I knew it, I had whirled around and was staring at her with my mouth open and blazing eyes. Through with me, I repeated. But what have I done to you? Sit down and shut up, Aunt Addie bellowed. I sat. I was sure of one thing. I would not be beaten by her again. I had often been painfully beaten, but almost always I had felt that the beatings were somehow right and sensible that I was in the wrong. Now for the first time I felt equal to, the, an adult, to an adult and I knew that I had been beaten for a reason that was not right. I sent some emotional problem in Aunt Addie other than her concern about my eating in school, which I didn't do. Did my presence make her feel so insecure that she felt she had to punish me in front of other, other pupils to impress them? All afternoon I brooded wondering how I could quit the school. The moment Aunt Addie came to the house, I reached home before she did. She called me into the kitchen. When I entered, I saw that she was holding another switch. My muscles tightened. You're not going to beat me again, I told her. I'm going to teach you some manners, she said. I stood, fighting. Fighting as I had, mm, fighting as I had never fought in my life. Fighting with myself. Perhaps my uneasy childhood, perhaps my shifting from town to town, perhaps the violence I had already seen and felt took hold of me. I was trying to stifle the impulse to go to the drawer and to the kitchen table to get a knife and defend myself. But this woman who stood before he, me was my aunt, my mother's sister, granny's daughter. In her veins, my own blood flowed. In many of her actions, I could see some elusive part of my own self. In her speech, I could catch echoes of my own speech. I did not want to be violent with her, and yet I did not want to be beaten for the wrong that I had not committed. You're just mad at me for something, I said. Don't tell me I'm mad. You're too mad to believe anything I say. Don't speak to me like that. Then how can I talk to you? You beat me for throwing walnuts on the floor, but I didn't do it? Then who did? Since I was alone now with her and desperate, 
I cast my loyalties aside and told her the name of the guilty boy who was sitting in front of me, feeling that he merited no consideration. Well, why didn't you tell me before? She asked. I didn't want to tell on other people. So you lied, huh? I couldn't talk. I could not explain how much I valued the code of solidarity. Hold out your hand. You're not going to beat me. I didn't do it. I'm going to beat you for lying. 